Facilities that make this program possible are provided by the City of Highland Park. Programs are produced independently by members of the community. The City of Highland Park is not affiliated with the following program or the producers of public access programming and is not responsible for the content. The following program does not reflect the opinions of the City of Highland Park. Hello and welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. I want to, uh, first of all, I want to thank a couple of people before we start the show. I, first of all, they never get thanked, and I really want to thank my crew today, which is my director, Larry Beyer. I want to, and my other crew, Irv Walanka, and the famous Ron Levitsky. I want to thank you for being there for us all the time, and um, we want to, you know, it's, the show wouldn't go on without them. I also want to thank my sponsor, the Bluegrass Restaurant, for a delicious lunch with great service. And um, that's, how we all, that's how we get to talk to each other before the show, and I find out everything you ever wanted to know about my guests when I have lunch with them at the Bluegrass. So again, thank you. My guest today is a return guest who I always enjoy having on, and that's Rabbi Roy Schwartz, who is a, or he is a Messianic Jewish rabbi. This is an oxymoron, right? Ordained minister. And we're going to be talking about how the Bible relates, what is happening today, and how it could bring peace. You know, with our political system, everybody is so angry. You know, every time you talk, people are, you know, you can't talk without being called a racist, about anger, or about whatever, you know, possible things that they talk about. About nowadays and I was reading some of the chapters in the Bible and you recommended the chapter on Isaiah, Rabbi, Isaiah 53 Isaiah 53 Correct. and I was wondering how that relates I know you told me to read it I I was reading it and it's also considered a forbidden chapter of the Bible as well so I want to talk about that, but before we talk about the forbidden chapter, since it's an oxymoron, rabbi, messianic, and ordained minister, how do you have all these titles, and how did this, you know, what did your parents say about it, and your friends, and all the different people that you run into, what are their comments? Well, I came to faith in Jesus in the early 70s. I was bar mitzvahed in the Orthodox tradition. And uh, in the 70s, it was a very tumultuous time. And my parents at that time were pretty liberal and uh, actually were always pretty liberal, uh, even though they wanted me to have an Orthodox uh, religious education. Uh, my mother really was, had forsaken traditional Judaism, my father as well. But for the sake of my mother's father, I was bar mitzvahed Orthodox. And uh, once I was bar mitzvahed, I was done with that. And so uh, for from the age of 13 to uh, when I came to faith, about 21, 22, um, I, it, it was, I was just a young, rebellious young man involved in the uh, movement in the 60s and 70s. And so when I came to faith and believed that Jesus was the Messiah, they were just relieved it wasn't drugs or alcohol. <laughs> so it, it wasn't too bad for me. Yeah, because um, when people hear, you know, that, uh, you know, I always... For many times I do talk about you and uh, good things, good things, and they said, and they are saying messianic. You know, that's he's not Jewish. You can't be Jewish being messianic. There's no way, and they get really uptight about it too. And um, you know, it's like, uh, what do I say? You know, what? How do I handle this? And. Um, it, it gets to the point where people kind of attack me. You're going, you're, you're friends with a Messianic rabbi, and you go, you know, uh, once in a month 
uh, to a Bible study group with him? What are you doing? You know, and um, I haven't even talked about it with my children, especially a couple of them, because they would just come on me. Mom, what are you doing? You know, that's what I would get from them. So tell me about, you know, why are people so afraid of it? Why are they so, you know, when they hear messianic, they get really uptight? Well, I think uh, one of the reasons is is that uh, the course of through the course of history, the worst things that have happened to Jewish people have happened in the name of Jesus. And so the idea of Jesus being something that Jewish people would be involved in is is very difficult for them to accept because our our, our trials, our our pogroms, our our persecutions, our uh, inquisitions, you name it, all have happened in the name of Jesus. And uh, even Hitler justified his treatment of the Jews as, as doing service for God and country. The, the uh, backbone of the Protestant religion is uh, the theology of Martin Luther. And Martin Luther wrote a treatise on, on the Jews and their lies and that, that we should gather them into the synagogues and burn the synagogues to the ground singing praises to our Savior. So the idea for being uh, of, of a Jewish person accepting Jesus is, is like joining the enemy. It's, uh, it's anathema to, to everything Jewish. And so that's the reason why you, you're getting such pushback and such uh, opposition. But really, Suzanne, there's nothing more Jewish in the world than believing in the Messiah of Israel. I mean, the Gentiles who have come to faith in Jesus have really come to the God of Israel. That's what Isaiah 53 talks about, that, that God promised through the prophet Isaiah that one would come who would deliver our people and be our redeemer, our uh, atonement, who would be the one who would pay the penalty for our sin. Um, up until that point, we had sacrifices that were offered. And then God said, I'm going to send a perfect sacrifice, my son. And, and, and that one who was spoken of was spoken of through the Jewish prophets. But because of what happened throughout history in Christianity, or churchianity I like to call it, um, and the, uh, the, re the visceral response that they had to the Jewish people when we didn't as a group accept Jesus as the Messiah, that's why there's such pushback. But there's nothing more Jewish. Than and he and apparently you found him in the Old Testament because when you think of Jesus, you think of Jesus as the New Testament, right? Because they talk about Jesus in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. um, I remember I was on an airplane many years ago, and I was sitting next to a Jewish. Um, she was a, a, a Jewish woman, and and a Christian woman, and the uh, Christian woman. Uh, gave me her um, Bible to read, and the Jewish woman, she, she, I think she was Orthodox, she grabbed it out of my hands and she said, you can't read that. I said, why not? You're Jewish, you can't read the New Testament. So I was thinking, you know, so, but, but then I found out uh, that you see that Jesus is in the Old Testament as well. He is not just came out and all of a sudden there he is in the New Testament. He starts from the from the the testament from the, yeah. the Torah. Right. The, the Moses wrote about him, the prophets wrote about him. Uh, virtually in every book of the old covenant, the older covenant, uh, the Tanakh as we call mm -hmm. it. Uh, there are glimpses of how we would recognize the Messiah. Now, the majority of uh, of Jewish people see the um, there are two kinds of messiahs described in the scriptures. There's a, there's a messiah who would be the coming king, who would overthrow the nations, who would establish, re-establish Israel to its greatness and its glory. Uh, that's the messiah most Jewish people are looking for. Uh, the other messiah that's described is one who would be betrayed by his own brethren, the one who would be uh, suffer and, and die at the hands of our people and ultimately be resurrected and in, in that resurrection uh, remove our sins. The reason he died was the prophets foretold in that particular chapter, Isaiah 53, particularly describes him as one who would suffer for our transgressions, but that he would ultimately remove those transgressions and bring to us life. Hmm. Because today we were talking about um, one of the we're going back now to the political system of what's going on today and all the anger and the uprising and there's a lot and I said to you something uh, 
about isn't there something in uh, in the Bible in the Tanakh the Torah that there was all the there was anger in that period of time too and that I guess I guess we could we could even say it, it was about Jesus they were very angry well that was in, in, yeah. certainly in the time of Jesus but right. prior to that there have been times where we have been uh, uh, rebelling against God and experiencing uh, God's discipline upon us, and uh, and ha we're very upset about that. So, what's going on? How can we relate what's going on today and all the anger and uprising, and and uh, the Bible? Well, I, we live in a day of lawlessness. We live in a day when when men do not want God's law or God's ways over them, and so every man is doing what's right in their own eyes. Uh, when, when we make uh, our own way um, the way that is right, uh, rather than God's way, we, we realize and experience the consequences of our behavior. And part of the consequences is anger and enmity toward those who will not agree with us. Uh, that's been going on since time immemorial. And, and so we're in a period of lawlessness right now where, where men are just doing what they think is right. What, what they believe is right and will not have God or his ways in their lives. Well, what happened? What ha I mean, people at one time were religious and, you know, it seems like, um, you know, kids when they finish Sunday school or have their bar bat mitzvah or their christening or whatever in the other religions, they just kind of forfeit religion. You know, it doesn't oh, yeah. seem, in the old, they don't go back to it anymore. In the days gone by, there was, in the United States, uh, religion was very well accepted. I mean, Catholicism, Protestantism, Judaism, and all of us stayed within our realm, but we all feared God. We all had a, a perspective of God and his laws, and we submitted to them. And so there was a, a, a more civil discourse in our society. But now we've, you know, because many of us have rejected religion because of some of the excesses, some of the abuses, some of the uh, uh, rebellion on the part of those who have named the name of their God because of sin. Uh, and so people have said, well, I don't want anything to do with religion because of all the tragedy it's brought, wars and, uh, and uh, sexual misconduct and, and abuse within uh, authority, uh, sexual abuse and so on, uh, pastors and, 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 and priests. And, and, uh, and, and so religion has become less of an influence on our lives. And as a result, we are now looking to men. We look to man, and that's why uh, we are so divided. Because either we have uh, we have one worldview or another worldview, and they're at cl they're clashing with each other, and and we have no one to look to beyond our own worldviews. Yeah, because I mean, we can we can look into immigration, and there's people are talking about oh we don't like immigrants. That's not true. It's about illegal immigrants. Of course, we like immigrants. I mean, it wasn't for it wasn't for immigrants we wouldn't have the United States. Right. My I mother mean, was an immigrant. Yeah, my my grandparents were immigrants, but they came through Ellis Island, and they also were sponsored. They always most people that were uh, came through Ellis Island also had a sponsor mm -hmm. in those days. It's well. Uh, so people came in legally, um, you know, through Ellis Island. If you, if uh, somehow it, 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 you could be sent back, you know, even at Ellis Island, if you were ill or something wasn't right about you, you could also be sent back. But people looked into laws. And then we, we had another show just recently with our other show from The View of Highland Park. We talked about abortion. And nowadays, uh, you know, we have this, you know, the right to choose. If you want an abortion, you have an abortion. You have a baby, you don't want a baby. I mean, that wasn't the laws of the Bible. You know, uh, there, there, there was a definite laws to abide by. And it seems like law, there's no laws anymore. No one wants to abide by laws. Well, there's all kinds of laws. It's just that we, you're right, we don't want to abide by those laws. And, and uh, or we break those laws or, or we ignore them. And what, and what was happening in the Bible? How did they, when people started, I remember the golden calf, right? And that was, uh, they broke the law, you know, by having uh, an, idol. an idol. So how is it handled in the Bible when people break laws? Um, what, what, is, what, what happens to them? Or what is, how do they um, amend by, what, what goes on in the Bible, how can we compare or how people can even look to the Bible 
to, you know, to, to have a different outlook in life. Well, under the law for, for idolatry, the punishment was death. For breaking the Sabbath under the law, the punishment was death. Hmm. The idea was that, that, uh, that God would put instill in his people fear of breaking his commandments. But the promise was if we kept his commandments, we would have blessing. We would have life, um, prosperity, uh, all kinds of blessings if we kept his commandments. But if we disobeyed his commandments, there were consequences. Now we have a new covenant. And, and that new covenant says that the law is written on our heart. We leave now the consequences of, of law-breaking to the Lord, and, and what we are called to do as believers is to love, is to, is to actually lay down our lives for others, is to, to love others as we love ourselves and, and, and to care for others. So the idea of, uh, of a child being abandoned, we would, we would care for that child. In, in Roman times, uh, Instead of abortion, they would just leave the baby to, to die. But what the, the Christians would do is they would gather those babies and raise them as, as souls, as, as children of God. And they, would, and they would redeem those children. They would care for those children. And, uh, and so that was a worldview different than Rome. And eventually, over time, the Christian worldview... Uh, overcame the ungodly view of, of Rome. And so uh, the, the, the ways of God became uh, predominant and, and uh, society uh, was transformed. Now, admittedly, what happens many times is when the, the uh, church or religion becomes part of the state, things uh, are, are become a problem. In fact, in God's law, God said the priests could not be kings and the kings could not be priests. Well, in Christianity, in 325, all of a sudden the, the emperor of Rome became a Christian and it became the state's religion, Christianity. And so the, 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 the uh, religious became ascendants. They became uh, those that began to run and influence the government. And then you have all kinds of uh, of. Uh, uh, corruption and evil, where church and state are merged together, crusades happen in the name of God, uh, other people are murdered and killed, and, and and so this is one of the reasons why the Protestant Reformation eventually came, and and um, and, and things began to unfold to where we are today. Um, but but then the the Protestants began to uh, become corrupt, to become. Uh, um, yeah, with the BDS movement. Well, I not mean, only BDS, yeah, but, uh, but, but uh, all kinds of financial impropriety, sexual impropriety, uh, um, um, chauvinism, uh, treating people disrespectfully, uh, racism. We had slavery. We justified it in the name of God. I mean, all kinds of things that were done in the name of religion that were, that were an abomination. And so people rejected religion. Uh, and, and um, you know, we justified uh, kings doing anything that they wanted. And so you had the French Revolution and the anarchy that followed. So uh, when, when people do not obey God's commandments and walk in a way that is godly, uh, there are consequences. And we are living in a society right now that is experiencing the consequences of our choices and, and also the religious leaders' bad behavior. And so people have shucked off religion, saying that there's no light or truth in it. But in reality, if we, if we follow the example of the Messiah, of Jesus, who, who gave his life for others, who loved others, and called us to, to serve others, and esteem others as more important than ourselves, if we would do that, we would model what it is to be a true Jew and what it is to be a true Christian. And how, you know, with all this anger, in fact, I was just, I, I was just looking at a paper that, about anger. It says, angry people are, are poor communicators and even worse listeners. Their empathy is for, foreshortened and they have trouble imagining the other's point of view. It makes people less healthy and when both parties are angry, fewer are likely to find the middle ground. Uh, it, if the only way people feel they may be heard is when they are angry, then our public discourse will be an arena for shouting past one another. And it says you can be principled even when you speak in a soft voice. And 
with all this yelling and screaming and you hear this on the news 24 7 people there is so much anger every station you put on and you hear the anger on the news and um, how how can we how can people eventually start listening to one another I and mean, it's, it's okay sometimes it just to agree to disagree but people don't even want to hear what the other person says they think by talking real loud and upstaging them with their voice they'll be able to hear better but in, in reality is the, the softer you speak the more you can hear it's certainly the case for Gandhi and and uh and Martin Luther and others that uh, had a great impact, uh, nonviolence and, and humility, they had a, an incredible in impact on society. And that really is the way of the Messiah, the way of Jesus. He calls us to humble ourselves, to esteem others as more important than ourselves. Well, how could you get people back to religion again? Since I mean, we were talking about religion, you know, at one time everybody was into their religion, and now they're, they seem to bypass it. It's like they, they don't want to be bothered with it. It's, it's too, you know, they don't have enough time for it. You know, they don't make time for religion anymore. Um, how do you see as a rabbi, as a person of faith, as a minister, how do you, how do you, how are you going to bring people back to reality again or bring back to what, what would be good for them and healthy for them? Well, from my perspective, what the scriptures say is faith comes by hearing and hearing from God's word. So one of the key things that I do is help people to look into God's Word, into the Scriptures, to look at our history, how we got to where we are, the, the history of God's people, His, his calling out uh, of people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, uh, looking at uh, Adam and, and, uh, and Cain and Abel. And, and uh, just as you look at the Scriptures, you're able to see really the flow of history of God, the Creator, and, and, and his uh, commandments that he's given to us, and just the flow of history. I mean, just studying the history of Scripture can transform a person's life to realize that God is real and that those that choose him experience life and those that reject him experience uh, what we have today. How do you get them to, listen, to read Scripture? Maybe well, that's just I a mean, good idea. Yeah, I mean, you uh, know, how, how are you going to get that, you know, well, um, hopefully by having people who can teach them or by them, if you, if you just sit down and read the book of Genesis, just start there. Just read it as a, as a novel. Just read it as a book. You'll see that, that, that it, it, there are truths that are transformable that can change a life. Do you see a correlation of what happened then to what's happening now? Yes, I very much so do. In what way do you see it? Well, I see uh, in the time of Judges, there was a period where, where God's law was forsaken and every man did what was right in his own eyes and there was just one uh, nation after another subjecting his people in, in, in ways and then God would raise up a deliverer or judge. There'd be an overthrowing of it and, uh, and there would be peace for a generation, maybe less, and then they would go back to their own ways until a king came, until, a, uh, until God appointed a king. Then there were good kings under Israel, but then there were bad kings under Israel. Um, and so we, we follow the history of that. Again, how the prophets spoke to their, to their ungodliness. I mean, uh, what does God require to love and to do justice to one another, uh, to, to care for the widow, to care for the orphan, to care for the stranger. I mean, that's part of our commandments, is to care for the stranger. Uh, I think our immigration problems would, would begin to be ameliorated if, if those who say they're Christians started acting like Christians. And uh, those who are not uh, aware of what, what the scriptures teach, learn what the scriptures teach, that it does, in fact, call us to justice and righteousness. I mean, Martin Luther King uh, w was a, a man of God, and the things that he talked about were rooted in scripture and based in scripture. And now and now everything is about Donald Trump. Donald Trump has ruined the whole community. He's ruined the nation. How could one man, do you think one man could do everything? Do you think if there was a different president that we elect a different president, you see anything 
that would be different, or it would be the same thing with a, a, a disguise, with a different person. It wouldn't help anything. I think the scriptures teach us that sometimes we get the leaders we deserve. I think we have a leader we deserve right now. And, you know, I, th I think in, in some ways, you know, he, has, he, he, he is an expression uh, of the ill um, manners that exist in our society today. And he's, he's an archetype of that. Uh, unfortunately, for those who oppose Donald Trump, he's the president, right. and uh, has, and wields a great deal of influence. And uh, and many who are for him, I think he's doing a wonderful job. While uh, those who were uh, favoring uh, President Obama didn't think he was, uh, thought he was doing a wonderful top job. And and uh, uh, but even even then, there wasn't so much. Uh, controversy and so much anger you know you just even if you didn't vote for the president say Obama or Clinton or any of the other presidents you, you never saw the rise of the anger as it is today people seem to just it's all it's out of control well we are doing what's right in our own mind in our own eyes and and this is just like the period of judges and so when we have a, a certain perspective and people don't agree with that perspective we rise up against it and, and, and for us it's a win or lose thing it's a it's a do or die uh, statement or a do or die cause so that uh, if you take the cause of the uh, that's against us we have to do everything to oppose you because if from from that world view you control everything that that exists right now uh, the the worry of the Supreme Court the control that the president has over appointing Supreme Court justices um, the the and and also the discourse of our president right now is alienating people and so all of those things are, are, are causing us to become polarized. But again, if we had a fear of God, we would know that this too will pass, especially in this country where the longest a person can be in, in office is right. eight years. Yeah, eight years. I mean, it's not like a, a lifetime. That there are certain leaders that are appointed themselves for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So things will change, and people should know that, mm -hmm. that it's not going to be the same. And I see uh, my cameraman is putting two fingers up, meaning that we only have two more minutes. And are we, how are we going to resolve the situation? Would it, in your way, I think you mentioned finding God within oneself, finding possibly in their own religion. What is